Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, this talk is joint work or based on joint work with Nunu Flytas, Alan Klaus and Haluk Sengun. Um, and the title is the Fermi equation and the unit equation. So to start us off, everyone knows the statement of Fermat's last theorem proved by Andrew Wiles, and says that this equation here has no non-trivial solution. So every solution has to satisfy ABC is equal to zero, where you, your a, if you take your ABC to be rational numbers and the exponent L uh, to be at least three. You may also know this um, other theorem by uh, Jarvis and Meekin. Um, they, they proved Fermat's last theorem over Q root two. Um, and you notice that there's a, a slight difference apart from the, the field, there's a slight difference in that their exponent starts with L equals five. So they don't allow L equals three. And the reason for that is that this equation has solutions for L equal to, to three when you take your field to be Q root two. So you can ask what should the statement be for um, a general number field? What, what should the conjecture be? And here's a, an attempt at formulating a conjecture. So this is, I've called this the asymptotic Fermat conjecture. And it says that um, if K is a number field and it does not contain um, the cube roots of unity, so zeta three is a primitive cube root of unity, then there's a constant BK um, such that if your exponent L is uh, bigger than BK, so you take a prime bigger than BK, the only solutions to the Fermat equation with exponent L and unknowns belonging to K are the trivial ones that satisfy ABC equal to zero. Okay, so I'm going to call that this the asymptotic Fermat conjecture or AFC for short. And you might be wondering why we have this restriction on the field, cube root of one is not in K. And it's a, so as you know, if you add the cube roots of one, you get zero. So as a consequence of that, for every L bigger than three, you're going to have, a, if, if your cube root of one is in K, you're going to have a non-trivial solution to the Fermat equation for all large, uh, for all exponents bigger than, than three. Uh, so maybe the statement of the conjecture should be, let K be a number field, then there's a constant L bigger than, uh, there's a constant BK such that for exponent L bigger than BK, the only solutions to the Fermat equation are either the trivial ones or the permutations of this. Okay, um, so the talk is going to be about uh, the relationship between this conjecture and the unit equation or the S unit equation. So I'm going to get back, get to that eventually. And attempts at proving not this conjecture in complete generality because it's uh, unrealistic, but proving this for some interesting infinite families of number fields. Okay, so to start us off, um, we're going to have um, a crash course on what you might call the, the modular approach to Diophantine equation or the 
uh, you know, the, the proof of Fermat's last theorem, but in a slightly broader context. So we look at not at exactly the Fermat equation, but the Fermat equation where we've put in an extra coefficient. So, so P is going to be some fixed prime, uh, some fixed odd prime. Um, and um, yeah, I'm going to look at this equation. And um, what I'm trying to do is to um, apply the, the strategy of the, of, of the proof of Fermat's last theorem to make deductions about the solutions. Okay, so this following Sale and Maser. Now, the first step uh, you do, and, and, and you do this because it makes things slightly easier later, is you take the three terms and one of them we're going to call capital A and one of them we're going to call capital B and one of them we're going to call capital C, but we permute them in a way so that the, the middle one, capital B, is the even one and because everything is co-prime, uh, the other two will have to be odd, and one of them will have to be minus one mod four, so that's my A, and the one that's one mod four will be my C. So we do this permutation, and then we write down this elliptic curve, it's called the fly curve, that, um, yeah, it, okay. Um, so there is, a, a mysterious step that happens after this, or several mysterious steps. So theorems of Maser, Wiles, and Libet um, tell you that somehow this elliptic curve that we've built from an unknown solution to this equation is related to a modular form. So a new form of weight two and level uh, 2p. Um, so there's, there's no point in, for the purpose of this talk it is to sort of delve too deeply into what is going on here. So we'll take this as a, as a sort of a starting point and um, see what it tells us. Um, now, here we have a um, a congruence of two Galois representations, but I, I want to get rid of this uh, relationship straight away and write down a more elementary consequence of this. So by the way, this is the hardest part of the talk. Um, after a couple of slides, we'll be reduced to doing very easy um, uh, manip manipulations. Um, okay, um, so this relationship, whatever it means, it implies a congruence between the traces of Frobenius of this Fry elliptic curve and um, the coefficients. These are the coefficients of, of the cusp expansion of F. Um, so I get a relationship of every prime Q that I choose. I'm going to get something like this. And what's lambda? Lambda is some prime ideal that divides my L. Um, and it, it's a prime ideal of the ring of integers of the field of coefficients of this new form. Okay, so to summarize, um, if, I, if I pick a P um, and I look at this equation, somehow a solution is associated to a new form of weight two and level two P, and this is the relationship. And there's only finitely many new forms of weight two and level two P. So if I was, if I didn't have the P, so I'm just looking at the Fermat equation, uh, there would be no new forms of weight two and level two. Um, and I would say contradiction, and the proof of Fermat's last theorem, that, that's, that, that's the end of it. Um, but in other cases, in some other cases, um, you're going to have finitely many new forms. You can compute them by algorithms of uh, 
Cremona and Stein. And you can say, well, now that I know the new forms and I know their coefficients, what do they tell me about the solutions? So here's what happens next. Um, this prime ideal lambda, which I said is a prime ideal that is above L, it's going to divide some explicit constant that I build from F. For every prime Q, I get this constant here. Um, so because, well, you're in one of two cases. So if you're in the second case, then it divides either this one or that one. And if you're in the first case, uh, you'd say, okay, AQF, I know it because I have the new form. But I don't know what this is, this integer is. But this is something in, I know that this is something in Z and it lives in the Hasse interval. So it's an integer that whose absolute value is less than twice the square root of Q. So lambda must divide, divides this difference. So it divides one of these differences. So I've got this number for every prime Q I choose, I can calculate it. And I know that lambda divides it by, for some mysterious reason. And um, because lambda is also divides the prime L, what's L? L is the exponent in my original equation. I know that L divides the norm of this. So this is living in, in a number field that's generated by the coefficients of F. L divides the norm of this thing. So this is something I can calculate. And you might think about, you look at this and you say, oh, great. I've bounded the exponent L in this equation. I have a bound now because uh, it divides some norm. <clears throat> and that would be true um, if this number here is non-zero. So you can say, well, when, when should it be non-zero? So one situation it should be non-zero is if this AQF, if I, if, if I have a prime Q for which AQF is an irrational number, okay, it's not in Z, it's an irrational number, because here I'm subtracting something in Z from something not in Z, I will get something that's non-zero and likewise here. So this would be non-zero. So the conclusion is if F is irrational, meaning that for some, some of its coefficients are irrational numbers, I'm going to get a bound, an explicit bound on L, which is the exponent in the equation that I'm working with. And so I'm reduced now. Um, so I say, good. Well, maybe I, I, I no longer want to solve this equation. I want to do something realistic. I just want to bound the exponent. Um, so if I'm bounding the exponent, I'm now happy to delete all the irrational uh, new forms uh, from my list. And I'm left with the rational ones. And rational new forms. <coughs> So by something called the Eichler-Shimura theorem. So this is the converse of the modularity theorem. Modularity theorem tells you, you start off with elliptic curve, there's an associated eigenform with rational coefficients. Okay, Eichler-Shimura, it's the other way around. You start off with an, uh, this modular form with rational coefficients, it's associated to an elliptic curve. So there is an elliptic curve E, it's not the same as our Fry curve, it's something else, but it has, it's something that you get from this rational new form and it will, its conductor is equal to the level of the new form. So it's going to be 2P. And because I've started with, a, with an explicit, with, with a, a fixed P, um, as, as in, in my coefficients of, of the, this uh, twisted Fermi equation, I can go away and, and look in Cremona's tables and list 
let's say, all elliptic curves of conductor 2p and ask, what does that tell me? But you can, you can take the argument a little bit further, this, this kind of argument here, and um, you can show that there's a, an even bigger constant, um, so it doesn't matter what we call it, an even bigger constant such that if L, if the exponent L is bigger than this even bigger constant, then you can assume that the elliptic curve E um, not only has conductor 2P, but full two torsion, okay? So if, if I don't have full two torsion, then I'm going to find some prime Q for which this constant is non-zero, and I'm going to get a bound on the exponent L. That's how the argument works. Okay, so now you're sort of reduced to saying, if I want to get a bound on the exponent L, I have to rule out elliptic curves of conductor 2P and full two torsion, and well, what you know? Let's let's try to write them down. Okay, let's write. Them. So here's how you do it. You say elliptic curve with uh, well full two torsion. It has a model like this where u and v are integers, and the discriminant, because we have conductor two p, is going to be a power of two times a power of the prime uh, P. And um, yeah, uh, but the, the, the discriminant has this form here. Um, it's, 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 it's 16 times the discriminant of this cubic polynomial. And so you say, well, U must be plus or minus a power of two times a power of P. V must be a power of two times a power of P u plus v must be a power of two times the power of p up to psi. We take these two and we substitute them in here and we get an equation. And now you can go away and solve this, okay? It's, it's very easy and it's an easy exercise to show that when you solve this equation, the prime p has to be either a Mersenne prime or a Fermat prime, okay? Because, you know, Mersenne and primes and Fermat primes are one away from a power of two. So you can see that they're, go they're going to give you an, a solution to this equation. I, I, let me just say that this equation has other solutions. For example, one plus one equals two. But if you work backwards, if you take the solution one plus one equals two, you put it in here, you're going to get something like conductor 32, not conductor 2p. So um, although we've reduced to solving this equation, we are not interested in all solutions. Not all solutions, when we go back, will give us conductor 2p. Okay. And uh, so here's the theorem of, of, of uh, Serre and Maser, which um, when this was pr proved, it was assuming uh, Serre's modularity conjecture, but it's now unconditional. Um, uh, if P, uh, you know, thanks to theorems of Wiles and the bit, or thanks to the uh, proof of, of, of uh, Serre's modularity conjecture by Carey and Vantenberger. So if P is neither Marsen nor Fermat, then in this equation here, the, the prime exponent is bounded by some explicit constant, which is going to be something like, I mean, if this was worked out by Alan Krauss and something like P to the 12 P, if I remember correctly. Um, okay, so as a summary, if I have a Fermat type equation and I want to use this Fry curves and, and, mod, and, and Galois representations of, of elliptic curves and modular forms to say something about it, then it, you end up having to do one of three things, either computing all new forms of a certain level 
all computing all elliptic curves of a given conductor and full two torsion, or computing all solutions to a, an S unit equation. Um, but well, maybe the word all is wrong here for the last one, because as we saw, okay, well, what's an S unit equation? We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. So here is an example of an S unit equation. So I'm, I'm going to define it in a minute, but notice that here we weren't interested in all solutions. We were only interested in some solutions that satisfy some further conditions, because when we work backwards, not all the solutions to the S unit equation are going to give us an elliptic curve with the correct conductor. Okay, so what's an S unit equation? Let, let's talk about that. Um, so here's the general setup. You have a number field K. S is a set of prime, I should say finite set. So S is a finite set of prime ideals. And um, I have this thing called the group of S units. Um, so this is the notation, OS star. It's elements in the multiplicative group of the field um, that are only supported on the primes, prime ideals appearing in S. So if I take any, if, if I, it's, it's alpha such that the valuation at any prime not in S is zero. Okay, so if I take alpha and I think of it as a fractional ideal, I factor it, I'll only see things in S. And the S unit equation is this equation. So epsilon plus delta equals one, where epsilon and delta are S units. And so here's a, here's a very simple example. If you take your K to be Q and S to be two, then the S units, well, they're the numbers whose, the rational numbers whose valuation is zero at all odd primes, the primes not in S, so you get powers of two up to up to sign. And if you look at the solutions to this equation in powers of two up to sign, well, you get three solutions, half, half, two minus one, minus one, two. And if you take, okay, if you throw in an, uh, another prime, an odd prime P, then your S units are um, are these, and the solutions to the S unit equation will be these three, plus if, it, if P is a firmer or Mersen prime, the things that you get from that. So, you know, uh, firmer prime, my, uh, you know, minus a power of two is one. All right, so more of a, a, a sort of a little bit more background on S unit equations. Um, so by the way, we finished the hard part of the talk. So everything is, is going to get much easier now, but okay. So we do know, thanks to a classical theorem of Siegel, that an S unit equation has only finitely many solutions. Um, and there's this really beautiful theorem of Iverza. This is, uh, I think the most famous result in the subject, which is that the number of solutions to the S unit equation is, is bounded uniformly in terms of three things. So it's the R1 and R2, that's the signature. Uh, so the number of real and complex embeddings and S is the number of, of prime ideals in the finite set S. Okay. so you have this bound and there's other bounds. There's bounds on the heights of solutions. Uh, for example, due uh, to Bijot and Giori, but they, they, they take um, more notation to write down. So I've, I've, I've missed them out, but that's a, um, a, a famous, uh, famous result. And there's algorithms. So if you start off with, with a, a, an explicit field K and an explicit S uh, set S, there are algorithms that, that find all the solutions to the S unit equation, starting with D Vega. So the, these, al, uh, you know, D Vega's algorithm. And I think everything that follows it uses essentially um, 
Baker's bounds plus LLL uh, to, to uh, compute the solutions. Okay, and this is still, we, we, you know, a lot of progress is, is with these algorithms have been made in the last, uh, last few years. So, but things are still happening. So here's a, a theorem which really surprised me when I saw it. Um, and it surprised me because it's, um, it's the statement is very simple, uh, but in a, in, a, in a subject that's 100 years old, you don't expect uh, a new discoveries of, of this generality and, and elegance. Uh, so this is a, a theorem due to Theantifalu, and it says if you have a number field K, um, N is going to be the degree, and there's two assumptions. One is that three doesn't divide the degree, and the second one is that th the prime the three splits completely in K. Then the unit equation has no solution. So here the unit equations S is the empty set, okay? So um, my OS star that I had before is the units of the field K, okay? It has no solution. And notice that somehow Tefalu's theorem is, is, is saying, <clears throat> I have a restriction on the degree, I have a local condition on the field K, not on, not on the unit equation, just on the field K, and these two together, they tell me that the unit equation has no solutions. So one of the things that, that we're going to be doing a little bit later is looking at similar, uh, similar theorems, uh, okay, that has been discovered since, um, of this type, okay? Restriction on the degree plus local condition imply that the unit equation has no solutions. Um, I'll also say <clears throat> that I believe um, that, and, and maybe some people might correct me, um, but if you fix a number field, and like, let's say, you know, of degree five, so the first condition, well, let, let's go a bit higher. Let's say degree seven. So the first condition is, is not, is, is satisfied. And you look at the set of um, number fields of degree seven where three splits completely, I believe that set should have positive density somehow. But, but I, I think we do not know how to prove that yet. So potentially uh, to the Antiphilus theorem saying for every degree other than, 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 than uh, the one, okay, for every degree not divisible by three, we have this set of positive density of number fields, you know, conjecturally, uh, for which we can rule out solutions to the unit equation. And so one of the que natural questions, now that we've we said that there's a connection between the Fermat equation and the S unit equation, is can we prove results of the type, restriction on the degree of the number field, local conditions on the number field, implies instead of unit equation has no solutions, the asymptotic Fermat equation, uh, Fermat conjecture. So, so a statement about the Fermat equation, not the unit equation. So that's, that's what we're trying to answer. And um, so here's, here is the, the main tool. Um, so we spoke um, a little bit, uh, we spoke ab about this example of Sarah and Mazer. So here's a, some kind of generalization to number fields. Um, it says that if you take K to be a totally real number field and um, you, so we're going to have these two sets of prime ideals. S is going to be the prime ideals dividing two. And T is going to be the prime ideals dividing to of residual or inertial degree one. So what this means, the second condition, is I'm taking the, the um, prime ideals where the residue field is F2, 
they go in T. Everything else, uh, all, all of the prime ideals above two go in S, and the ones with residue field F2 go in T. And I'm assuming that T is non-empty. And now I suppose that every solution to the S unit equation, uh, this S unit equation here with this S, satisfies some extra condition, which is if I take a solution here, I can find a prime Q in this set T where the valuation of epsilon and delta is not big, okay? It's bounded by something explicit. So that's the, so that's the condition. Uh, then the asymptotic Fermat conjecture holds for K. So that means that the exponent L in my Fermat equation over K that's bounded, is bounded. And um, so this theorem is one of several theorems of, of the form, local conditions plus assumption on the solutions. Okay, it says assumptions on the S integrate, assumptions on the solution of the S, local assumptions on the uh, solutions of the S equation implies the asymptotic Fermat conjecture. Okay, there's other theorems like that, but uh, we just see a specimen. Um, so how is this proved? Well, um, there's nothing actually very clever. It's just following exactly the same strategy as Serre and Mazer. Uh, but uh, of course, you know, because you're dealing with elliptic curves over number fields and, and modular forms over number fields, you need different, you need, um, um, yeah, you need contemporary versions of, 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 of the, the theorems of, of Wiles and, and, and Mazer and, and Dribbit. And so here's, here's some of the, so one of the things you need is Merel's uniform boundedness theorem. Um, another, so that's, that's sort of, you can think of this as a, um, something that replaces Mazer's isogeny theorem in the, the proof of uh, uh, Fermat's last theorem. And you need, um, so these are, you could think of them as some vast generalizations of the theorems of Wiles and Libet. So modularity lifting and optimization theorems due to many people, I've, I've mentioned some, Kissin, uh, Barnett, Lamb, G, Galati, Broy, Diamond, and so on. Um, so, and there's also, so the, the theorem that I've mentioned on the previous slide, it assumes that the number field is totally real. And the reason for that is that these modularity and, and, uh, and level optimization theorem, they're, they're sort of, um, yeah, um, there, are, there are the sort of, uh, so we do know, for example, uh, thanks to recent theorems, of um, uh, Allen, Carey, and Thorne, that uh, a positive proportion of elliptic curves over each imaginary quadratic field are, are modular. Okay, but um, that's but we're still missing something called level optimization. That's the analog of Ribet's theorem over general number feeds. So there's a verge, but if you assume some standard conjecture in the Langlands program, then you can just write down almost exactly the same theorem for general number fields. Okay, so um, here's, a, here's a sort of a very explicit example. Um, you take this uh, quartic field, this is totally real, and um, to ramifies in this quartic field, so S and T are going to be just this uh, set. And uh, the great thing about this is that Nigel Smart figured out the solutions to this S unit equation, which is exactly the ones you need in, in the, uh, the thing that you need to apply uh, the theorem 
mentioned a few slides ago. And you find, so there's 585 solutions, but you find that they all satisfy this condition, that their valuations are sufficiently small. And the theorem tells you that the asymptotic Fermat conjecture is true for K. Okay. So what I'm going to do uh, from now on is um, go through some elementary calculations with S unit equations and um, to try and, uh, and sort of come up with a theorem like the Antifalous theorem um, for number fields where some prime ramifies. So to Antifalous theorem, we had three totally splits. Here we've got um, a prime P that isn't necessarily three. And P, the assumption is that P is totally ramified. So uh, when I factor P in the, in the ring of integers, I get this Gothic P to the N where N is the degree. And so I'm, I'm going to do some very explicit um, algebraic number theory. So the first observation is that if I have a, something in the ring of integers, epsilon, um, then its norm is going to be congruent to epsilon to the n modulo p. Okay, so let's, let's see how this proof goes. Well, totally ramified, one of the things it tells me is that the residue field of Gothic p is the same as the residue field of the prime p. So it's, it's a, the field fp. And so that means when I look at epsilon modulo p, it must equal something in here. So it must equal something that's in z. So epsilon is equal to a, is congruent to a for some a in z. And now, I mean, I'm going to, I, I need a definition for norm. So we will know, we used, uh, well, I often think of norms as products of conjugates, but you know, that, that is only convenient when you're dealing with a Galois extension. So here's a, a, one way to define norms is you, you look at this linear transformation, okay? Um, which takes an element of OK and multiplies it, at, and, uh, okay, and, and multiplies it by epsilon. And so this, uh, if you think of OK as a Z module, so it's something like Z to the N, once you've fixed a basis, then you can represent this T epsilon by a matrix, an N by N matrix, and the norm is defined as the determinant of this matrix, but because of this here, epsilon is the same as A mod A mod P, where A is something in Z. Um, our matrix is going to be, when I think of it mod P, is going to be A times the identity matrix, because both of these on an integral basis um, reduced mod P, they, they just do the same thing. And now when I take norm of this, that I'm going to get the norm of this one, A I N, A times the identity, which is A to the N, and A is the same as epsilon. So I've, I've proved this, um, what, I, what I was trying to prove. Okay, now let's take this result and apply it not to arbitrary elements, but to units, okay? So if I, so here's what I get, is if I have a number field, same assumption as before, okay, I've added P is odd, that's not important. P is totally rabified, and the GCD of the exponent N with P minus one over two, is one. So I'm assuming that these two things are co-prime. The degree n is co-prime to p minus one over two. Um, I'm taking now not an arbitrary algebraic integer, but a unit 
in OK. And the statement is that under these assumptions, the every unit is plus or minus one modulo gothic p, the unique prime ideal above my, my small p. Okay, so how do we prove this? Well, the previous lab tells me that epsilon to the n is congruent to the norm of epsilon. The epsilon is a unit, so it has norm plus or minus one. And now I, so I'm, I'm almost there. I, what I do is I think of epsilon to the n. I think of the image of epsilon to the n in this group here. Okay, so this is, I'm taking the multiplicative group of the residue field of P and I'm quoting out by plus or minus one, the subgroup plus or minus one. So epsilon to the N maps to the identity element in this, in this group because it's congruent to plus or minus one mod P. Uh, but if you think about this group, it's the same as this one here uh, because my, the residue field of a totally ramified prime is the residue, residue field of the prime underneath it. And this thing has order P minus one over two. And I've conveniently assumed that the N, the exponent N here, which is the degree of the number field, I've assumed that it's co-prime to the order of this group. So because epsilon to the n maps to the identity element, um, so the order of the image of epsilon divides n and it divides p minus one over two, and these two are co-prime. So epsilon is the identity element, okay, in this group. So the identity element, so it has to be congruent to plus or minus one mod p. Okay, so, I think this is, you're probably thinking this is all ridiculous for a, a web seminar, but here we get a conclusion, um, which is that I, I impose these two conditions I've seen before. Okay, so I'm going to have P's, uh, I'm going to assume that P is not three, P is at least five, um, it's totally ramified, and the degree is co-prime to P minus one over two. And the statement is the unit equation has no solution. So assumption on the degree, local assumption on K, and we get a, a, the same conclusion as in Scientifilus um, theorem. And again, I mean, it, it should be true, it, it should hold for positive proportions of number fields where this, this uh, condition on the exponent is satisfied. So how do you prove it? Previous lemma tells me epsilon has to be plus or minus one because it's a unit. Delta has to be plus or minus one mod P. You take these and you substitute them into this equation and you get plus or minus one, plus or minus one is congruent to one. And that doesn't work unless P is three. So we get a contradiction for P not equal to three. Okay, I'm almost embarrassed to call this a theorem after I've shown you the proof, but anyway. Um, so, um, well, can we do something like this for the Fermat equation? And, and, and this is what the next theorem is about. And it says that if you have a totally real uh, number field of degree n and you take, and p is a totally ramified prime, um, any totally ramified prime that's at least five, and you have an assumption, okay, on the restriction on the degree, which is the GCD of ed and p minus one is one. Um, and you suppose two is totally ramified or inert in K, then the asymptotic Fermat conjecture holds for K. So here we have what we asked for before. We have um, to get the asymptotic Fermat conjecture, it's enough to have only restrictions on the degree and the local behavior of some primes in K. So there's, I mean, obviously infinite 
families of number fields of every odd degree that satisfy these conditions. And, and this is, again, one of several theorems. So there's theorems for you know, even degrees that, that do similar things. Um, so let's, let's have a look at the, um, the proof of this. Well, I'm assuming that the prime P is totally ramified. So it looks like this. If I factor it, I have a Gothic P to the N. And two, it's either inert or totally ramified. So there's a unique prime above two, which I called Q. So I have a prime Gothic P that's above P and a prime Gothic Q above two. And the exponent here is one or N. Um, uh, because it's either inert or totally ramified. And I'm thinking not about the unit equation, but about the S unit equation, because that's, that's what we need to uh, deduce the asymptotic Fermat injection. And recall that we're not trying to prove anymore that there are no solutions. Because there are solutions, you know, I can take two minus one equal one. That's a solution to this equation. But what I'm trying to do is to control the valuations of the solutions, because that's the theorem that I that I uh, we saw earlier. Is if the valuations aren't big, then you're fine. Then then um, asymptotic Fermat conjecture holds. Okay, so here's a typical case of, of one of the several cases you're going to have to look, look at, where epsilon is a unit and delta, so if epsilon is a unit, delta is one minus epsilon is going to be an integer. Uh, delta has high valuation, okay? So it's divisible by four. So that's, that's you know, already big valuation if, if in, your, in the case where the exponent here is n. Okay, so let's let's try to let's see how we rule out this case. This is the typical case of the proof. So you say, ah, you know, epsilon. So epsilon is one minus delta. Delta is divisible by four. So epsilon is one mod four. And okay, so that tells me that the norm of epsilon has to be one mod four. But um, epsilon is a unit, so its norm is plus or minus one. So I get plus or minus one is congruent to one mod four. So I see that the norm will have to be one, can't be minus one. So using this condition, I've deduced that the norm of epsilon is equal to one. And now we switch primes. We're not thinking about the prime of two. We're thinking about the prime above P. And we remember that the norm of epsilon is uh, congruent to epsilon to the n mod P. But we've already said that the norm of epsilon is one. So we get epsilon to the n is congruent to one mod P. And now I use this condition, condition three. A condition three is saying that n is co-prime to the order to, to the to the uh, okay the order of the multiplicative group of the residue field of p okay which is p minus one n is prime to p minus one so i deduce that epsilon is one mod p okay so that's my second deduction and now I look at delta. What's delta? Delta is one minus epsilon. So delta is one minus epsilon. That's one minus one modulo this prime ideal. And I've written contradiction. Why is this a contradiction? Because this prime has to divide delta and delta is an S unit. It's only allowed to be divisible by Q. It's not allowed to be divisible by the other prime P. Okay, so this is a, a typical case. So all the proof is just um, elementary algebraic number theory like this. And you deduce this, this theorem, which gives local 
uh, sufficient local conditions for the asymptotic Fermat conjecture to hold for a, a number field K. Okay, so let me, um, in the last few minutes, let me uh, give a, another um, interest, so an interesting family of number fields uh, for which we can say something about the unit equation and the asymptotic Fermat conjecture. Okay, um, and this is the ZP extensions of Q. So these are very popular in Iwasawa theory. And uh, basically, if you take any, well, I said odd prime, that, that's the important. Okay, so let's take an odd prime P. Um, and you look at the, the this field of the the uh, p n plus one th roots of unity. Its its Galois group is isomorphic to this, and you can take the fixed field of this subgroup here. So you're going to get something whose Galois group is this z mod p to the nz. So this, this we denote it by QNP. It has nothing to do with periodic numbers. It's, it's a number field that is totally real. It's Galois, it has degree P to the N. This is its Galois group. And if you fix your P, okay, P totally ramifies in here because it, it, ramif it totally ramifies in this one. All the other primes are unramified and you get a tower of, you fix your P, you vary your N, you get a tower and you take the, their union. And this thing, Q infinity P is called the cyclotomic ZP extension of Q. So in Iwasawa theory, um, you know, uh, people study things like uh, the ranks of elliptic, so you fix an elliptic curve, let's say over Q, and you go up this tower and you want to know how the ranks behave um, as you go up the tower. But you can ask sort of similar questions for other Diophantine problems. And as a corollary of the theorem that we wrote before, because in the, in the, in the theorem for, for unit equations, uh, we had that the prime P, uh, the, the a prime P totally ramifies, well, that's true for this thing. And P had to be at least five, so you have to rule out three. But it seems that it turns out that two is allowed. Um, and uh, okay, uh, and the degree had uh, the degree had to be co-prime to P minus one. Well, the degree here is P to the N. It's co-prime to P minus one. So you did use that the unit equation has no solutions for this family of number fields. Now, I'll, I'll point out that this doesn't work for P equals three, and uh, there, there are solutions. So it's an open problem. Um, you know, can, can you determine the solutions uh, for the unit equation for Q and three as N varies? But, but you know, if you fix, if you fix N, um, you can you can just run a program and you get you 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 get the solutions, um, and I'll just say that this corollary is in the spirit of uh, this conjecture. So it's a it's a conjecture of Zahid and and Parshin that says that if you if you have any curve of genus at least two um, over the rationals, um, then the as you're going up the tower, the set of rational points stabilizes. So X Q infinity is finite for all primes P. I mean, so if you, it might look like these two are not connected, but there's a common generalization uh, pointed out to me by Min Yong Kim, where instead of curves, you look at hyperbolic curves. And then this one, becomes a special case of this conjecture. Okay, so let's look, let's, let's go to Ferber and, and, and finish off with this slide. Um, so for these um, ZP extensions or the layers of the ZP extensions, um, it turns out that the, the 
the, what the theorem I wrote before imme immediately gives you this theorem or this corollary. I should have called it a corollary, um, which is if you take a, a prime p that's at, that's not three. Okay, maybe you, you can include two. Um, okay, p is at least five. And for odd primes, you need an extra condition, which is that P is non-V Fritsch. Okay, so non-V Fritsch means that two to the P minus one is not one mod P squared. Then the asymptotic Fermat conjecture holds for each one of these number fields. Um, okay, so maybe I should point out a few a few uh, things so why wh why do we need this non v fritsch assumption well it's equivalent to two being inert as you go up in this tower um, so um, so in in the theorem that, that we had before for the the Fermi equation over uh, number fields with local condition we wanted two to be either ramified or totally ramified or inert. So this gives you this condition. Um, and so this, I mean, uh, so uh, uh, I think a very um, vexing open problem is to show that there are infinitely many non v Fritsch primes, okay? It's, it's really surprising that we don't know how to do that. But it seems that almost all primes are are non v Fritsch. The, the only ones that we know to be v Fritsch are these two, 1093 and, and 3511. And um, this condition also uh, pops up in, 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 in the classical uh, uh, theory of Fermat's last theorem. Uh, v Fritsch showed that the first case, so p, okay, the exponent p does not divide any of the variables, like in the first case of the Fermat's last theorem, holds for exponent p. And uh, we sort of might have noticed the word effective here. Um, so for the constants I'm talking about, the, 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 the bound on the exponent in the Fermat equation, for that to be effective, what you need is modularity of elliptic curves over the particular number field that you're talking about. And um, uh, that, uh, so, for, for, so effectivity makes use of the following beautiful theorem of Jack Thorne, which is the elliptic curves over these um, ZP cyclotomic extensions of Q are modular. Okay, that's an excellent place to stop. Thank you very much for your attention.